chapter there. Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. Then the, spirit of, then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day and for your word, Lord. Herein lies your power. I pray, God, that you would use it mightily today. I pray, that God, that our ears would be prepared to hear what you have for us. We love you. We thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of the message today is Go and Behold. Go and Behold. Here we have Philip, a deacon. Now, if you turn back a few chapters to chapter 6... You'll find him first mentioned. Chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among yourselves seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word back in our text in chapter 8, in verse 26, we find this very Philip having an encounter with the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. The angel of the Lord here calls to Philip, speaking to him clearly, Go. Go to this dry, go to this desert, go to this desolate wasteland. Not the most appealing of mission fields. Nevertheless, verse 27 begins, And he arose and went. Today, so often we hear of missionaries getting called to Bermuda and getting called to some beautiful place in the Caribbean. Oh, God's calling me here, and it may be so. But to the desert here... Philip is called, and he goes, not thinking to himself of this dry, desolate waste that I'm being brought to, no sign of him complaining, murmuring, disputing with God. Here this wise, this honest, this spirit-filled servant goes where his master leadeth, simply follows, simply arises and goes on his way. Verse 27 continues, it says, And behold, and there's where we get that part of our message, go and behold, that title. A man of Ethiopia, an eunuch, 
of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So here, the, the setting is a desert place. The characters, Philip, a deacon, a wise, honest, spirit-filled servant of God, goes where he's bidden of his master, and we find here an eunuch. Now I'm reminded as I think about Philip, this man simply going where he's led, of, of Abraham. The Bible records of him in that, that Hall of Faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, that Abraham obeyed. I love that. Abraham, when he was called to leave and to go into this land that he, he did not know anything about, simply obeyed. He obeyed and he went out. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what was the purpose. He was simply God, God called him to go to a place and he simply, as Philip here, arose and went. Abraham had faith in his heart, a trust in the God of glory. For he looked for a city whose builder and maker was that very God, and he simply followed him. Go in faith, Christian, and behold what God will do. Now here, this eunuch is what Philip beheld. From a distance, as he, as he approached, from, from, from far off he saw, behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Now there's, there's um, differing terms and, and definitions of that word eunuch. I think he was an officer. I think this eunuch was an officer, and he was under the authority of Candace, the Bible records her as the queen of the Ethiopians. And so he was of great power. He was of great prestige. He had a lot of responsibility. And I think he was very much respected because he had care over not some of her treasure, but all of her treasure. This man was trustworthy. This, this man was faithful in serving her. And look at also, we find him faithful in coming to worship God, best he knows how. He had the charge of all her treasure, and it continues and says, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now here we find him, of course, at Gaza, a desert place. Um, if you were to look at the map, even a modern map from, let's say, Jerusalem down into Ethiopia, about 4,000 kilometers, it's about a three days drive today, but I would expect it would take him about a month to get there. And he traveled all this way there and all this way back for to worship. For to worship. Now here we ask it again. I think pastor said it last week, what's our excuse? <laughs> this man gets up and goes, leaves his country. This man gets up and leaves what he knows, and he comes for to worship the God of heaven there in Jerusalem. Work didn't stop him. Distance didn't stop him. Time, energy didn't stop him. He didn't need no me time. He came to find God there in Jerusalem. Amen. Now he's on his way back. The Bible says in verse 28, now returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Now, here's what came to my mind about this. Uh, we travel quite a ways to come to church. Um, some, some of us travel likewise. Made the effort to get up to go to come for to worship the God of heaven. But when we return, are we found reading more Bible? Are we, are we, are we found in the book of Isaiah? Are, are we fine searching the scriptures, getting more? Or do we just come and, and, and put in the time and get what we need and, and enjoy the fellowship that we have and then turn and go back to ooh, everything else? But here this man was found in his return journey, sitting in his chariot, reading the Isaiah the prophet, getting more God. He traveled to seek the Lord. He's returning and he's seeking the Lord. It's amazing. Look at the sincerity in this man. Now, I'm reminded immediately of Matthew chapter 7. You can go there, keeping your finger in the book of Acts, Matthew chapter 7. Now, this is often looked at as a, as a teaching to the disciples, but not too long ago, I, I preached through this, and one thing that I noticed that was interesting about, about the uh, Beatitudes 
as it's called, is that in chapter 5 it says, Seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and so that's where we take and say, well, then this context indicates that he is getting away from the multitudes, he's with the disciples, and now he's teaching them, those disciples in particular. But the amazing thing that I found was that as, as you got a little bit further and this teaching rounded itself out, suddenly those multitudes are there again. You know what they were doing? Seeking the Lord. <laughs> he couldn't get away. Everywhere he went, I'm going to get a desert place. I'm going to go to this, this, this quiet place and teach my disciples. Well, before you know it, halfway through his message, there, there's, a, there's a couple come, come walking up. And then there's a few more. And then next thing you know, in that mount, it's full again of people seeking God. And so I don't dismiss this. I don't dismiss anything in the Bible and said, oh, that's for them. <laughs> that's for somebody else. This is, this is, this is my word. And so there in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. So even in the wording there, is this teaching for disciples or is it for every man? Because I think verse 8 says, every one. That asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If you ask, if you seek, if you knock. God's coming to give you a fish if you ask a fish. He's coming to give you bread if you ask bread. So back in our text, I believe this is exactly what the Ethiopian was doing. Asking, seeking, after God. And look how the Lord honors him by sending an evangelist. He asked. Maybe he's even before this moment happens asking, what is this? How can I understand this? I don't don't comprehend. Who's he talking about here? And so the man asking after God, the man seeking God has an evangelist show up. Imagine that. Verse 29 there in Acts chapter 8, it says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. There might have been more than just one in that caravan. He picks out the one and says, Go to this chariot. Go to this one. I love this too because I see also the the Lord here honoring the Spirit-led, honest, wise servant who was just before, if you read the beginning of this chapter, seeking God all the same, serving, ministering unto him. Now the Lord sends him to a seeker. Isn't it amazing? The one seeking has an evangelist come. The one looking for someone to evangelize, the seeker is sent his way. This reminds me of um, 1 Corinthians in chapter 3, 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. <clears throat> the Bible says there in verse 5, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then... Neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now here he talks about how the Lord gave every man this minister in particular. The Lord provided a minister by whom these believed. The Corinthians in particular. Now, I believe what the Bible said here is that every man is given a minister by whom they believed. We just uh, mentioned my wife here and, and, uh, and, and, and Dana's father. It's Dana's father. A minister by whom she believed was there at the appointed time to, 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 to give that appointed word that, that ministered to her heart in that appointed way. She was born again that day. 
Now the question I immediately ask myself is, well, if, if God gave every man a minister by whom they believe, then why isn't every man believing? Well, here we have in the context of 1 Corinthians, we have a carnal church, we have babes, we have potentially unbelievers. I think the answer is clear. There's ministers provided for every man, but simply there's a lot of ministers who are choosing not to be ministers. (laughs) There's a lot of men that are choosing not to receive those same ministers if they do come. See, God has has provided everything needed. He's given his word. He's given his his men. He's enabled his his men. He's gotten people born again and giving them the command to go. And as they go, behold his works. And yet men don't go. Men don't minister. It's something we ought to consider. And I'm not trying to guilt trip people here. But I believe every one of us has a ministry. And if we decide not to perform our ministry, not to believe God, not to trust Him, not to follow in the direction that He is leading, there just might be that chariot out there that's missing a minister. There just might be that eunuch sitting there going, "Ah, how shall I understand except some man should guide me? We continue on there in 1 Corinthians 3. In verse 8 it says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. I love this. For we are laborers together with God. Okay? Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. But you are laboring together with him. He works in you. But you work out. That's how this works. God fits you. He he fashions you. He prepares you as a good husband should. He builds you up as he would want you to be. And then he asks you to come labor together with him. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the foundation, of course, we all believe that. Christ is the foundation of our faith. He is the chief cornerstone. He is the head. But we ought to be wise, and we ought to take heed how we build upon that foundation. Why? So that he can get the the maximum increase that he desires. God gives the increase. I'll never deny that. But I but I believe that 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 God desires, and certainly He is worthy of of much more increase than, than He has today. So let's get laboring together with Him, Christians. We see now the importance of being personally engaged in what God wants to happen. Building upon His foundation, watering, planting, so that He can give increase. We see over in Acts chapter 8, I believe, the perfect representation of what's being discussed to the Corinthian church. I don't think Philip needed to be told of this sowing and watering and, and, and laboring together with God type of relationship. He might have been taught it at some point, but at this point in his life, he's on board. He's ready. He, he's, he's prepared to do what God wants for him to do. So the ideal scenario here plays out. Of God using sowers, God using waterers, To make a great increase. A great harvest. There in Acts chapter 8, look at verse 30. And Philip ran. (laughs) There was an expectancy. I wonder if he stood up again and he was looking at at this this great caravan before him. Again, this is is the, the second in charge, likely, of the queen of the Ethiopians. He's not just... Traveling, you know, on, on a single mule. 
for a month. I believe he had a great big caravan in there. Philip is told to go into this desert place, and he's probably thinking, hey, it may be desert. It, it may be wasteland. It may be there's no water anywhere, but hey, I, I, I know where the water is. I'm, I'm drawing living water. The Bible says, out of, out of my belly shall flow living water, because I'm believing in God, so I'm going. He gets there, and then he's like, which one, Lord? And God says, Join thyself to this chariot. Go, go to that one. He's running. <laughs> He's already sprinting up next to this chariot. The Bible says in verse 30, Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? He, he, he enters with a question. Now what I love seeing here though is that the two men are in, in a, a completely just... Normal situation. Okay? The, the men were in the mundane and here God's about to work a miracle. Here I don't think there's any particular method employed, but God brings them to a moment where they're going to be together at this time. Here in verse 31, he says, How can I except some man should guide me and desired Philip that he would come and sit with him? Here the man, he sought a man... But the power is in the manuscript, and the man is Christ Jesus that he's seeking. And so Philip joins him. Continuing on down in verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, Isaiah 53. What a, what a great place to find somebody reading. <laughs> Almost like it was planned. <laughs> And like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, judgment was taken away. His judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or, or of some other man? And so again, Philip's just being an evangelist. That was his job. The eunuch is, ju is just being a eunuch. That was his job. And, and somehow, in the mundane, God's about to work a miracle. We don't find here any particular method employed. Philip simply obeys God, goes to where God told him to go, and he asks him a question. Do you understand this? How can I accept some man should guide me? Who's this prophet speaking about, himself or, or some other man? This man is seeking a man, and he's about to meet the man, Christ Jesus. If you ever wanted to find out the method, if you ever wanted to find out the plan of salvation, here it is right now. Acts chapter 8 and verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, began at the same scripture, preached unto him Jesus. <laughs> There's your plan of salvation. Christian, open your mouth. Begin at the same scripture. Begin at the scripture that applies. Begin with the scriptures. And find a way to preach Jesus. Hey, he's there. All of it. There. Numbers 15. The burnt offering and the sacrifice. Jesus. Let's see here. Chronicles, David, type of Jesus. <laughs> we can find him. And that's the job of the evangelist. Open your mouth, go to the scriptures, preach Christ. Verse 36, and as they went on their way, they came into a certain water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So Philip here is, is preaching Jesus. And for some reason, the question comes up, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Now, either Philip had sort of led along the way and he was now talking about baptism, or uh, the eunuch is just interested in, in, in everything that he had, he had just beheld. And I think this is probably most likely. Remember, he was in Jerusalem. Think of what was happening at this time in Jerusalem. Now, when I read the book of the Acts, 
to me, there's just so much action and activity. I, I in my mind, find, find it hard to put too much time between chapter 8 and chapter 2. It just kind of seems like everything is just boom, boom, bow, bow. But scholars say many years might have passed. I don't know what that is, but regardless... Chapter 9, Saul breathing out threatenings, a great persecution on on the growing church. We find right before there, Simon the the sorcerer and and, and the preaching that went before him um, changed him seemingly for a time and then we found that there was still wickedness in his heart. And right before that, Stephen was the the first ever recorded, anyways, martyr for Christ. Lots going on and now this eunuch shows up and he's about to worship God, and it's likely, because he's reading Isaiah, he's worshiping God after the Old Testament manner, after the the way of the Jews. But he saw this baptism going on, multitudes and multitudes and multitudes coming, being baptized and confessing their sins. Now whether he witnessed what happened in Acts chapter 2 and 3 and 4, or whether many years had passed, and now he, he's there again and the same thing's going on. I don't know that that's, that's clear to me. But regardless, I think he saw baptisms, and I think he said, well, you're preaching sounds a lot like those men that were being baptized, confessing their sins. And all that, that was going on, that excitement. Here's water. What, what, what is hindering me from, from doing that? What is hindering me from, from having this religious experience. He came to Jerusalem to worship. He says, is this part of it? What is this? Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So Philip was wise. Now I'm reminded here, and what often happens um, to me if I'm trying to evangelize, and maybe you've experienced this as well. It was a phenomenon that really became clear to me in, in Guyana. Okay? It, I went to Guyana and I want to go back. Um, one of the most re- receptive places I, I have ever been. You, 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 try to, you, you try to go somewhere to evangelize the people and you just get evangelizing to everybody on the way there and you never actually get to your destination. Just everybody wants to hear. You'll be preaching to one person. Suddenly there's 20 around you listening to you. There's, there's very little hesitation. There's very little um, pe- people refusing and rejecting to hear the word of God. It's, it's amazing. But one of the things that I experienced was this, this Guyana phenomenon that there was that one question. <laughs> that one question always standing in their way. Here, Philip opened his mouth began at that scripture in Isaiah 53. He's preaching Jesus, and he's like, but what about baptism? Just that one question. I've been in this situation where I'm opening my mouth, I'm preaching the scripture, I'm preaching Jesus, and it's like, but what happens to babies when they die? (laughs) Just just this one question that seems to completely derail everything. But Philip was wise to this. Now, in Guyana, there was always the one question. It was always something silly and far in left field. And you could either say, I'll answer that later and, and carry on preaching Jesus. Or just, if you had it, answer the question, they'd go, okay, continue on. <laughs> in Canada, I find that that question is often there to deflect and detract and say, get out of here, I'm done hearing this, right? It, it, it's a diversion. It's a distraction. That one question. Now, I don't see that the eunuch here was, was trying to divert or distract. I think he was generally interested. The man traveled 4,000 miles to, you know, 4,000 kilometers, sorry, to hear the word of God. He, he traveled all this way to worship God, and now he has this evangelist that ran up out of the desert, and he's like, I'm going to ask some questions. What is this baptism? What's hindering me to be baptized? And so he's sincere. Perhaps he wanted that. They look so happy. That looks awesome. I, I, want to, I want to enjoy that experience with God. And Philip brings him back to point three of his plan. And he preaches him Jesus. And he said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And look what he said to him. He said, if thou Believe us with all thine heart. He, he, he turns it around and he, say, he says, we're not, we're not talking about this, this religion. We're not talking about this experience. We're going to get personal here now, Mr. Eunuch, if you 
If, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest be baptized. And this isn't just a gateway to water baptism, believing on Christ. This is a, this is a gateway to being in the very Christ of the universe, the, the, the Savior of all men. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you in your heart confess Him, do you know what that means? John chapter uh, 2, if thou believest and confess not. The Bible says He confessed, but He denied not. He confessed. If you don't deny that, if you don't deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you believe that, if you're trusting in Christ, thou mayest be baptized. And what happens here between the Son of God, that period, and the next verse, verse 38, is the most beautiful, miraculous, amazing thing known to mankind. Man was born again. It's beautiful. God drew here the laborer together, along with God and His power the word of God went forth from that laborer to the end that a seeker was convinced to believe on the truth of the word, to believe on the God that saves the only Savior. God's word entered in. And in that period, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Period. Period. He confessed with his mouth. And the Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Philip, I think just as excited as he was to run up on that chariot, he commanded that chariot to stand still. Hit the brakes. <laughs> Couldn't get him in the water fast enough. Commanded the chariot to stand still. Stop! This man's been saved. Get in that water. And they went down both into the water, Philip and the eunuch. He baptized him. Now, the thing that I love about this is we really see the wonder of God's work here. There's no script. There's no rehearsal. There's no pretense. There's no routine in the evangelist Philip. He was just doing his thing. And God says, go to that wasteland. Okay. <laughs> and God says, that's the one. Get on it. And as he walks up, sorry, he runs. He's invited. And he finds there a man already in the scriptures. Isaiah 53, one of the most pivotal prophetic scriptures of our Lord. The man's reading and he says, teach me. Tell me who is this? Is this prophet talking about himself or is somebody else? And he opens his mouth. He begins at that same scripture and he preaches Jesus unto this man. And the man says, how do I get baptized? And Philip says, you got to be saved. Believe with all your own heart what I've been telling you. He says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Here's a natural birth. A spiritual birth in a completely... Natural way. Again, no script, no rehearsal, no pretense, no routine. Just the Word of God entering into a man and that man being born. Yeah. <clears throat> now, for several years, I, I've, I, I've been around... And I think a lot of us maybe have experienced the same thing. I, I've run with crowds that are into this structured soul winning, which is only knocking doors, and it's only on Saturday, and I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious here, and it's only between noon and three, and it's only this, and it's only that, and it's always this way, and this is how we do it. And I'm not against it. 
<laughs> I'm not against it. But when we take uh, sanctioned, structured soul winning, we pair it up and, 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 and compare it to walking in the Spirit. Amen. There's a great gulf fixed between, isn't there? And what you see here is walking in the Spirit. A man doing the mundane, being called of God to go, whether he would or not, going, finding, God already prepared a heart to receive the Word. What? <laughs> now the reason why I'm, I'm not against this sanctioned soul winning is, is, is because first and foremost, it, it's, it's commanded of God. I believe we're commanded to go. There's another one of those examples of people take a, a, a Bible verse and say, oh, that's probably just for the disciples when he says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, again, I, I, I take that and say, well, then we're, we're doomed if that's the case, if it's only for them, they're gone. They're dead and they're on into glory. Nobody's going to preach the gospel if that's just for them. But I can take this as well as I can take this as well as I can take this and say, these things were written to our, for our learning as our example upon those people whom the ends of the earth have come upon. This is mine to read and to take example and to learn and to practice. And so when Jesus says, when Jesus says, Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. i got to ask myself, how can I do that? How can I get involved into this going and into this preaching? How can I get involved in what Philip here did? And he, he went and he beheld. Go and behold what God's going to do. And so, yes, we are commanded to be witnesses unto Jerusalem, unto Judea, unto the uttermost part of the world. But the problem I find quite often is, is many of us don't know what that is. Don't know how to do that, let's say. One, I don't think, I don't think we, we, we spend enough time in the Word as, as a Philip did. And we might look at him and say, well, that was his whole job. Yes, it was his whole job. And he was prepared to evangelize. And, and he was prepared for the moment that he found himself in here with the eunuch. I get that. But each one of us can be prepared in the same way for the same type of scenario. To God be the glory. So what I like about the structured soul winning is it sometimes helps people who are nervous and helps people that are shy and help, helps people that don't know exactly how to take somebody from a question and a misunderstanding to hearing about Jesus. We, we just don't know how to do that. And so even for me personally, when, when somebody took me to a stranger's door and knocked on the door and said, hi, can I ask you one question? If you were to die today, are you 100% sure you'd be in heaven? Are you 100% sure you'd be saved and, and, and with Jesus? And they say, I don't know, except some man should guide me. Then, then that person, that, that man, that, 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 uh, that evangelist was able to show me gradually how I could do that same thing. And they do it before strangers, which is great because then I don't have to be embarrassed because I'll probably never see that person again. <laughs> when I'm like... Believe and turn around and walk away. <laughs> so you think to yourself... The professional athlete, they want to be able to, at the drop of the hat, hit a home run. At the drop of the hat, dunk on anybody. At the, at the drop of a hat, hit a hole in one. How do they get there? They, they, they schedule times in routine intervals to go and to practice their sport. That makes sense. And so the structured soul winning does this, and I found that this really helped me. It's like, it's like a training. It's, it's like giving yourself a time of devotion. It's, it's, it's bringing yourself to, to a, a place where you can be committed to something, where you can be motivated by other people that are out doing the same thing. But do, I, but do I then make the stretch and say, well, then that is it. That is evangelism. This is how I do it. I can't because I have to be honest with the scriptures and find a Philip that was just walking in the desert until God said, go to that one.
The structured soul winning that I've been involved in for so many years, the going to a door, knocking on them, asking them a question, leading them along the way in what I believe is a clear presentation of Jesus Christ, it's great practice. But to me, it's easy. What do you mean easy? Isn't it nerve-wracking? Yeah, okay. Isn't it a struggle to get out there and to be there every, every whatever interval you choose to do it? Isn't it hard to go and talk to strangers? Yeah, it can be. But after a while, you get in the routine, you learn, you, you learn the, the script, <laughs> you, 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 you figure out that basically every door is a, is a different person that needs to be hearing the same thing. You respond to questions that you've heard before. You start to understand all the different cults and what, what they believe and what needs to be broken down before they can be built up in the truths of the gospel. And, and it can become easy. It can become routine. It can become... But the challenge is then... Right? I said, this is the practice. This is the training. This is getting you comfortable with showing somebody out of the Scriptures. With opening your mouth, beginning at the Scriptures and preaching Jesus. This is where you get comfortable with that. Philip did that in his years of ministering in the church. The hard part is taking what you've learned with strangers and talking to your family. Taking what you've learned with strangers and talking to People you work with, talking to friends, even worse, friends that knew you before you believed on Christ. Taking it to the store clerk that you run into every day. Taking it to this stranger in a more awkward scenario. The challenge is being spirit-led, not just on Saturday in this window of time, The challenge is being spirit-led all the time. Following the Lord all the time. Listening to the angel of the Lord when he says, go here, and waiting on the Spirit to tell you to go to that one. Trusting God when, when where he's brought you looks confusing. A desert? A dry place? There's nothing out here. Oh, here comes that chariot. Okay, I see what God's doing here. That's the hard part. So again, and I've been conf- I've been accused of, and when I preach messages like this, of of uh, I've been a- a- accused of you know throwing a wet blanket on soul winning. <laughs> I'm not throwing a wet blanket on soul winning. I'm all for that. Get out there, do it. If, if that helps you, if you enjoy it, if you like it, if if that kind of routine and structure works for you, hey, great. If a church gets a group like that going together on a regular basis, things are going to get done for the work of God. But all of those people ought to then take what they learn back with them. And isn't it just like the eunuch? What I find is too many people in these groups, an independent fundamental King James only Bible believing Baptists are pretty typically guilty of this. They treat their soul winning like they treat their church. They go to church for to worship. They go to soul winning for to worship. And then when they return, they're sitting in their chariot reading the sports page. They're sitting in their chariot reading the news. They're sitting in their chariot reading a murder mystery. They're sitting in their chariot reading everything but the Bible. And that's what they're talking about. What I love, and I, and I said it before, tongue in cheek, we, we don't need more soul winners, we need more Christians. We need more believers that are believers all the time. We don't need people, more people in church. We need more people that come to church and then take what they learn in church to the world. We need people that come to God seeking Him for to worship. And when they return, they take what they have learned with them and they seek Him more. Come seeking God, go seeking God. Come for the gospel, go with the gospel. And when you do, when you go, when you go in faith, when you go following after God, behold what He will do. You will be that one that has a Philip and eunuch moment. 
Imagine being brought to a desert place, a wasteland, a, a, a nothing. Finding somebody coming by seeking the same God that you were just seeking a few minutes earlier. And that's how it should be when we come to church. We come seeking, we leave, and we find someone seeking. Amen. Glory to God. And that's what it means to be a laborer laborer together with God. He works into you something. You put it out there. And your plan is the same as Philip's plan. Open your mouth. Begin at the scriptures and preach Jesus. Our goal ought to be Christians all day, every day, from the time we wake up to the time we lay down our head, giving glory to him and leading people to our Savior. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. I pray, God, that it would not fall upon deaf ears, especially mine. Help us, Lord, to be seekers that come and seekers that go with what you gave us. I don't want to be the Christian that just comes to church, comes here to worship you, has a structure, has a routine, but when I return, I go back to the world. Send your spirit, Lord, to lead us. Lord, send seekers that we can minister to. You'll get all the glory as you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.